how are you doing today? Uh -huh. It's time. For, yeah, that's 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 for me, not for the kids. And so I'll remember. How are you doing? Yeah, I was thinking of my uh, my dear brother in the Lord, uh, Larry Radel, this morning. And uh, whenever I used to ask Larry, "How you doing?" Whenever I asked him how he was doing, he always said the same thing. I'm blessed. So it's my prayer this morning that you're blessed. That you're blessed in your knowledge of God, in your walk with your Savior. And uh, we do want to welcome you to New Life Family Worship Center this morning. We know you could be somewhere else today, and uh, we're glad you decided to join us. And uh, I have a couple of uh, thoughts here. These are things that are supposed to make you ponder, okay? P-O-N-D-E-R, ponder. Love is grand, divorce is a hundred grand. <laughs> I am in shape because round is a shape. Time may be a great healer, but it's a lousy beautician. There's always death in taxes. However, death doesn't get worse every year. If it ain't broke, fix it till it is. Is that a government say? You got that right, brother. And don't worry, uh, don't worry. In just two days, tomorrow will be yesterday. Right, so don't worry about tomorrow. So let's open our Bibles this morning. Uh, Romans 14, 1. And I want to speak to you. Uh, we've begun this 14th chapter of Romans on a new subject matter. Be we weak or be we strong, we be one. And remember uh, the last time uh, we were together, we started this section. And I stated that, uh, that sin, simply stated, is not the only problem that the church faces today, okay? There is another category of problems that are not, strictly speaking, a sin problem. And the church has to deal with them because they have the potential to create sinful situations, situations in the church. They can cripple the life of the church. And this thing that we're speaking, we're examining now, is the relationship between the strong and the weak. Christians within the church that are strong, Christians in the church that are weak. And those things, when, and I'll, I'll explain it more as we go along, those things aren't necessarily positive and negative in themselves. You'll see that as we go along, okay? But keep in mind that the issue that Paul is speaking about here is the issue of maintaining unity in the church. That's what he's talking about. That's what's important here. So as we look at this, remember that we're, that's the end result that Paul has is his desire. What we have here, and what I'll refer to, and as others have referred to them, these are non-moral preferences, non-moral preferences, okay? So as we, uh, as we uh, let's go ahead and look at our source scripture today. Romans, it's just one verse, Romans 14.1. If you're ready for the word of God, would you signify that by saying amen? amen? And would you please stand with me if you're able so that we can pay proper respect to the word of God. Romans 14, 1 says, Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. Thank you. You can be seated. So, the temptation in the church, uh, and this is a temptation, and you'll see that, I think, as we speak about it. And I've seen this work its way out in churches for years. I see it all the time, even in our church. The temptation is, you've got these, bro these brothers that I will call liberated brothers and sisters who fully understand what it is to be free in Christ. They're not hung up on tradition. They're not hung up on ritual. They're not hung up on routine. They're not on, hung up on forms, the forms of religion. They fully understand that they're free from sin and death and hell and Satan. And they understand.
understand the freedoms which they have in Christ no longer involve these formats and rituals and holy days and ceremonies and all of that kind of thing. They, they understand that they are free to make the choices in their life dependent on how the Spirit of God moves in their life, okay? And see, a lot of us, we fall into a trap. We, we sometimes want a road map that's external to us. But you have a road map which is in your heart. And that's the road map that you need to understand. That's the road map that you need to use. So we're going to call these particular individuals, for lack of a better phrase, this is what Paul called them. He called them the strong. Strong in faith that they understand their freedoms, okay? They understand their liberties. On the other hand, you have those that Paul describes as the weak in faith. What he just said in our source verse today, what did he say? He said, who was he writing to in our source verse? He was writing to the strong because he said, to the strong, he said in 14.1, receive one who is weak in faith. Okay? So Paul's saying that there's some that are strong, some that are weak. Okay? So the weak are those that are still in some way clinging to the past. They're not able to quite let go. They can't move away from what holds them down in regards to their liberation. And I won't say, I, I, this is not necessarily a chronological issue. Okay? There are people that have been saved for many, many, many years that are still would fall into the category of the weak. Okay? They really don't believe that the freedoms that they have, they can have. They really, they... they they, they believe some of the freedoms, but there's other freedoms that they find it difficult to accept. They can't handle it because of the, the preferences that they may have been, that they may have grown up with. They may have issues with the environment where they first went to church. They may have had negative experiences because of certain things that brought to bear, things that, that happened in their life. And because of those things, they have issues in understanding their freedoms. So they can't enjoy these freedoms, and they stay, these are the people that have kind of stay huddled in the middle of the church, and, they, and, and they're kind of faint of heart, and maybe they're making uh, some efforts to grow and understand and exercise freedoms, but when they do that, they do it very slowly, very slowly, okay? So what happens in the church is, because you have, Paul says, there are strong and there are weak, okay? The strong, what you have is the, that the strong will be, will be tempted to look down on the weak. And when people are weak in the faith, it usually causes legalism. Because they hang on to legalism because it, it's, it's a secure anchor for them. So they, they suffer from uh, legalism. They, they suffer in that regards in... Uh, and they get in the way of some of the people that want to push freedom. See, you've got to understand what Paul's going to tell you here is that neither one of these two circumstances necessarily is correct. Okay? They have to be managed in a way that makes them correct. So when some guy comes in and says, uh, I can't do that. You want me to do that in church? I can't do that in church. It offends me. That makes me stumble. I think that's a sin. And it's, if it is a moral preference, it's not a sin, okay? It's not a sin, and I'll explain that more later. But their reaction then of the, of the strong person is to look down on the one that doesn't understand their freedom, the one who hasn't grown up enough to understand what liberty is available in Jesus Christ. So they're bound to their personal preferences, and so there's a, the, the strong one might look down upon the weak one. Conversely, the tendency of those that we're classifying them as weak is to condemn the strong because they feel that they're abusive of their liberties, okay? To condemn them for the freedom. Well, you shouldn't be doing that. How can you do that? And so what you end up with, you have the weak wanting to condemn the strong, and you have the strong wanting to despise the weak. And that's the problem. And that was the problem in the church at Rome. And that's why Paul wrote about it. 
And you can see it very plainly in the scriptures. You may not have considered it before, but it's in there. And, and it happens, and it happens all the time. It happens to this day. There are people who are, who are in church who would push their freedoms right out to the edge. And there are people who are in church that want to hang on to that middle ground. They want to they tightly clench their fist. And they're bound to traditions, okay? And they're conformed to those traditions. And, and, and I will look at those more specifically as we go through the text. We'll get specific as we go through the text. But the clash of these two people comes when one does despise the other and when one does condemn the other because we have to understand each other, okay? And that's what Paul's going to tell us. Neither of those responses, to contemn or to despise, is correct. So there are those who comprehend their freedom who enjoy their freedom, and there are believers who think those that do that abuse their freedom. And there are believers who are weak, and they don't understand their freedoms in Christ, and they're holding on to those old vestiges of the past, and they're living a self-imposed life of unnecessary rules and rituals and routines. And they, that causes people to look down upon them at times. But the principle, the principle that Paul gives us here is going to teach us how we at New Life Family Worship Center can have unity even with the great spectrum of the strong and the weak that we have in our church, okay? Okay? That's what we're talking about. And this is an essential to a body of believers. There's a lot of scripture here. The whole 14th chapter and up to 15, uh, 3 is dedicated to this one subject matter, okay? He's, but Paul's going to give you principles that will teach us how we can have unity even with this great uh, spectrum of beliefs. And it's essential as a body of believers that we understand these things. So let's say at the outset, let's see if we're agreed in this, okay? Do we have freedom in Jesus Christ? What? Yes. Okay, I just want to make sure. I couldn't hear you very well. We are free, Okay from sin in terms of its penalty, correct? We are free from death in terms of its ultimate power, correct? We are free from hell in terms of its ultimate punishment, is that right? And we are free from Satan in terms of his ultimate ability to persuade us, aren't we? Okay, so we're free, we're all free in all of those areas. We are free to worship God, we are free to love God, free to be forgiven, free to go to heaven, okay? Okay? Okay. Amen. Okay. But there's another dimension in which you enjoy freedom too. I hope you know that. And that is this, that we are free as new covenant Christians from all the Old Testament laws that are strictly external and ceremonial. Did you know that? You are free. Because you are under a new covenant. Now, we're, now, don't you ever say that I said that we're free from the Ten Commandments. Because we are not free from the Ten Commandments. And we are not free from any moral laws that God gave in the Old Testament, okay? All right? But we're free from those things that pertain to ceremony. Jesus taught that freedom in the scripture, and I'll show you that. But we're free from external ceremonial rites and rules and rituals that, not a, that are not attached. Those things were attached to a certain people at a certain era in a certain dispensation. And we've entered into a new dispensation, into a new liberty that's cut off from ceremony and ritual and routine that was part of that old economy, part of that old dispensation, if you will. And, you know, many of us, we, we should enjoy that, and many of us do enjoy that, and many of us are immensely free. But, you know, I, I, I told you before, my last pastor in, in Clovis was a Messianic Jew, a saved Jew, okay? And him and I would talk, and because of his background, because of his upbringing, he was still, he always thought a little bit differently. And it was great to hear him teach and preach because he did think a little bit differently. But he would admit to you that he was tied to some of the Old Testament tradition, the way he was raised, okay? And so somebody like that, who, who, who's uh, living in the, what century are we in? The 21st, 22nd, I don't know, we're way up there, wherever we are. 
those sanctuary things always confuse me. But somebody living today, if they could have a problem like that, do you think people living back in the time that the letter is written to the church in Rome might have a problem like that? Do you think they might? You know, you had Jews that were being saved straight out of Judaism, okay? And they were, they were finding impossible, some of them, to let go of those deeply ingrained traditions, okay? For example, dietary laws, traditions along the line of holy days, feast days, festivals, new moons, sabbats, circumcision, all of their life they had been prescribed, they had been told you must maintain these things, and then they come to the new covenant and they have all this freedom and they're, they're very reluctant to let those things go. Many came out of this, uh, a legalistic system, and in their conscience, they're still thinking that way. They're still thinking in ritual and ceremony and tradition. In fact, in Acts 21.20, 20, the implication is there, there that most Jews were still bound to the, uh, the Moses dispensation, is, is the way I would phrase it. Their consciences still placed an unnecessary bondage of them because they were not yet able to experience their freedom in Christ. Now, that's one side of it. So you had these Jews coming out of Judaism, and then you have who else is in the church? That's right. You've got the Gentiles. You have the people coming out of the Roman society. Okay? They were straight out of paganism. They're saved from adultery. They're free in Christ, but even their background now limits them. Even their background constrains them because of their past pagan religious experience. So they couldn't enjoy some of the things that they should be able to enjoy right away. So you have a Jewish and Gentile factor. Jews wanting to hold on to what they have known all their life, and Gentiles, many of them holding on, and some of the others wanting to avoid the things that they had known in the past. Different spectrums, different people. And so when you had this, you had a sort of natural conflict between the liberated Gentile and the legalistic Jew in the church. And so this was a, there was a great potential for conflict there. Paul is teaching, and if, if Paul was teaching it then, you know what? It's still appropriate, even to this day today. You had Jews clinging on to the Old Testament. And... and and you had Jews who were just as free as free could be, okay? And uh, if you were a free Jew, you were, you were offensive to the ones that were clinging on to the old things. So you, you had all of these different e issues, okay? You know, you had, you had Gentiles that were delivered out of paganism, delivered out of their, their system of feasts and orgies, et cetera, et cetera. Some of them thought it was great. Now we get to eat, eat food that had been offered up to idols. But you had other Gentiles who just came out of that system that were offended by that very thought, okay? So you have all this spectrum of beliefs, all these spectrum, different levels of freedom in the Lord. And as a result, you have a conflict. The legalistic believer sees liberty as sinful. The liberated believer believes legalism is sinful. Let me say that again. The legalistic believer believes liberty is sinful. The liberated believer believes legalism is sinful. So you have, and, and Paul now, he's going to give us four marvelous principles that will overcome these issues in the church, okay? And I'll go ahead and give you four, all four of them right now. We won't finish all four of them today. In fact, we'll just get into the first one. But they stretch all the way from where we're at in 14.1 to 15.13. And the way to solve this problem, the way to, remember, what's the goal? Maintain unity. Maintain unity, okay? The way to solve the problem, the way to maintain unity, number one, he says, receive one another with understanding. We are to receive one another with understanding. And that goes from verse 1 through verse 12 in chapter 14. The second one, not only are we to receive one another with understanding, verses 1 through 12, we are to build up, build up each other without offending each other. Do you know how hard that is? That can be difficult. To build up each other without offending each other. 
And Paul's going to talk about that from verses 13 to 23. Build up one another without offending. The third principle that he's going to talk about is to please one another as Christ did. Chapter, uh, chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. Please one another as Christ did. Okay? And then fourthly, finally, in uh, 15, 8 through 13, he will speak about how we should rejoice with one another in God's plan. Okay? So he says we are to see, receive one another how? With understanding. Build up each other how? Without offense. Please one another as Christ did and rejoice with one another in God's plan. So over the next few weeks then, as, as best we are able, we'll be dealing with these, these four principles. And when we pass that, that 513 verse, we're really going to be in what becomes the conclusion of the entire epistle of Romans. So let's start with number one. We'll get our feet wet a little bit. I've still got time. And I've still got a lot of notes to cover. So let's see how far we get. The first principle is receive one another with understanding. Receive one another with understanding. Verse 1. And of course, as I said earlier, this is directed to the strong. Because it says, receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. Now before we look at that verse specifically, let's look a little bit at, let's get a feel of the background, what we're talking about, okay? Uh, the Jews have been raised to do what was, what's that Jewish word? Kosher. Kashar. Is in, the, in the Hebrew, it's kashar. Uh, phonetically, K-A-S-H-A-R-E. Uh, it's Kashar. When I was a commissary officer in the United States Air Force, every, for the, for the Hebrew uh, festivals and feasts, we used to receive Kashar foods, kosher foods. We would get all, we would get the matzah and uh, the unleavened bread, all those things. We would even get Pepsi Cola. Kosher Pepsi Cola. Yeah, that a, uh, a rabbi had blessed. I don't, know, I don't know at what stage in the process they bless it, but they had blessed it and it had a special mark on it. You know, there's a mark of kosher. And the word kosher simply means what is fit, what is right. And anything that is kosher to a Jew is right, correct? It is fit, okay? It's, in other words, it is proper, it is acceptable. And there's two things in the Jewish mind that are very, very dominant in terms of what is kashar. One is the diet, and the other is days. Special food, special days, okay? In Leviticus, you can go back in Leviticus chapter 11, all the way up to about the 45th verse, I believe, and you'll see the dietary restrictions. In Deuteronomy 14, uh, do you remember in Deuteronomy 14, uh, the story of Daniel and his friends taken into captivity in Babylon? They were told they were supposed to eat what? The king's food. Eat the king's meat. They were supposed to eat what was served to the king, what was provided to them. And in chapter 1, verse 8, Daniel says... I will not do that. Daniel was ex exercising his kosher conscience that would not allow him to eat those foods. And he has three friends, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, whom the Babylonians end up naming Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay, that's their pagan names. I mentioned their real Jewish names first. And they, along with Daniel, said, we're not going to compromise our Jewish convictions. We're going to eat kosher. Okay, and they, they're typical, that's very typical of the no compromise Jewish idea on dietary laws. No matter what the price might be, I'm going to stay with what's fit and what's right. What's kosher. And that, and that was right for them. That was proper for them to do that at that time in their history. Because those dietary laws were in effect. And all those special days that they celebrated were ordained originally by who? Who ordained those days? God. So they was right to adhere to those days, was it not? So God uh, had, the, it was is right for them to affirm the v validity of their beliefs at that time in their lives. 
On the other hand, then, though, you had Gentiles, and they were used to going to the feast, okay? Pagan festivals, many of which involved drunken, gluttonous orgies. And uh, those things left them vaccinated very often against certain things that, w that, that Christians would feel free to do. I mentioned that earlier, food offered to idols. But because of their experience in the past, they identified certain things with that life of paganism, and they didn't want anything to do with them now, okay? Now, there's two basic passages that illustrate what I'm going to speak of today, and we'll only look at the first one today. But the first one is from the Jewish point of view. Galatians chapter 2. And you can open your Bibles there if you want. Galatians chapter 2. And I'm not going to be in a hurry covering this stuff because I want us to, co to, to cover these things clearly and carefully as we go through it because I, th I do think they're important. So let's just get it set in our minds of what we're speaking of and then from the, in the weeks forward we'll, uh, we'll, we'll clarify, we'll get a clearer picture. So Peter, here in Galatians 2, Peter came to Antioch and Paul says... I confronted him to his face because he was to be blamed, okay? That's a deal, all right? The Apostle Paul comes before the Apostle Peter and gets in his face. One thing about Paul, when he needed to say something, he wasn't shy about saying it, okay? And in this particular case, something needed to be said to Peter, okay? And you know who Peter is. Peter is a significant person in the church. He's a main character, okay? He's uniquely the apostle of Christ in a way that even Paul had not enjoyed. Peter lived during the earthly ministry of Jesus, and he walked with Jesus. And yet, Peter, a brother in the Lord, did something that caused Paul to rebuke him to, a, to his face. And what did he do? Well, verse 12 tells us what he did. It said, certain men came from James. And who's James? The brother of Jesus, okay? The brother of our Lord. He's the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And there were certain Jewish men in the church uh, in Jerusalem who came to Antioch. And Antioch, that would be quite a, a journey up north. And before certain men came from James, okay, Peter was eating with the Gentiles, all right? Is that a deal? That ain't a deal. In fact, it's a good deal. Maybe they sat, sat down and had a ham sandwich. Maybe they had some pork chops. That, I'm serious, that's a good deal. That's a good deal for him to be sitting down and eating. The issue is, Paul's issue isn't with that. But when they showed up, the men from James who went up to Antioch, the Gentiles and the Jews, they meet. And when the Jews arrive, what does Peter do? He withdraws from the Jews. And he separates himself from Gentile food and Gentiles, period. And there's a, there's a, there's a, there, he goes and, and takes himself out of, uh, being with the ones he was with, and he separates himself to being with the ones that are coming. And why does he do that? Why do you think he does that? Here come the Jews up from, uh, up from, uh, up from Jerusalem, and when they come, he separates himself from the Gentiles. Why do you think he does that? He's afraid of the Jews. He's afraid of his own people and you know what he's afraid of what they will think because he's eating with Gentiles Lord forbid now consider who this is this is the Apostle Peter we're talking about we're not talking about an underling okay we're not talking about what we we're, we're talking about someone important very important in the Word of God and that, so these, these people show up, and he separates himself from those that he had been with, and he's afraid of what the Jews will think of him. And you know what he does? He, by his actions, Peter denies his liberty. Do you hear me? 
by his actions, Peter denies his liberty in Christ. Okay? And this whole thing has nothing to do with causing his brethren to stumble. And in verse 13, Peter is condemned as a hypocrite. He's hypocritical. And the diet, why is he hypocritical? Who knows about the setting aside of the dietary laws? Peter. That's who it was revealed to, okay? Acts chapter 10. The Lord gave Peter a, a, a vision of a sheet of a, a sheet coming down out of heaven, and all the animals were on the sheet, the clean and the unclean. That is, those that could be eaten, eaten kosherly and those that couldn't be eaten. And the Lord said, what did he say to Peter in his vision? He said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Go eat what you want to eat. And Peter said, well, you know, Peter, he was pretty self-righteous. He said, oh, Lord, I can't do that. I can't eat things that aren't kosher. And the Lord, you know what the Lord said? Don't you tell me what's kosher. I just change the rules, and I get to do that, okay? I don't care. I don't, I, don't you dare tell me what's unclean, because I have made all things clean. I have made all clean things, everything clean. And in effect, the Lord was saying, all that di dietary stuff, you know how on the whiteboard you get those uh, dry erase markers? He just took all that stuff off the whiteboard, okay? He's saying the dietary laws which were given to you in the Old Testament have been wiped away. It's omitted. And in the life of Peter, the Lord, uh, you know, in the life of Peter, even the, the Lord Jesus Christ himself re began at least to remove the significance of the Sabbath as it was once recognized. The Sabbath, okay? It's really the Sabbath. The Sabbath was, uh, was celebrated when? On Saturday, yeah. Well, we call it Saturdays, okay? But Jesus, when he came, he said, I am the Lord of the Sabbat. What's that mean? I have, I, I am, I, in, in essence, what he did was he completely changed the picture of what Sabbath was. He was breaking a t tradition. And eventually Christ rose from the dead. When did he rise? Not on the Sabbath. He rose on a Sunday, the first day of the week. And with that, he dis established a whole new thought process into the Sabbath, what the Sabbath really is. And so Peter, Peter knew all these things, did he not? Peter was with Christ, and he saw him after the res resurrection. Peter knew when the church met now. They met on the first day of the week. That was their main meeting time. They met almost every day, most of the time. And here come the Jews now, and when the Jews come up, up to Antioch where he's at, where he's fellowshipping with the Gentiles, he goes right back. He steps into the Mosaic law, and he says, I want to be over here with you guys. Keep those Gentiles over there. They're eating pork. They're doing this. They're doing that. And, and the rest of the Jews, it says in first, and the rest of the Jews, in, in verse 13, back in Galatians 2, the rest of the Jews are described as being hypocrites too. They weren't, ha they weren't hanging with the Gentiles either. And, and Peter was a strong personality, okay? And when he did that, Peter did it, the other Jews did it, and when Paul sees that, he says, man, that's not good for the church, you know, you, we've got these that are strong, and we've got these that are weak. We've got these that are le uh, uh, legalistic, and these that are liberated. And this isn't good at the church. And you know who became a victim of this whole process? Barnabas. And Barnabas was a bold man for the Lord. And even Barnabas became a victim of that. And Paul writes in verse 14, he says, But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel... The truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? What he's saying is, I don't mind you coming up here and living with the Gentiles. That's cool. Why, but why are you then going back into the Jewish camp? And then you want to make those Gentiles live like Jews. He's telling Peter, you're wrong. But I want you to know that that, that as a situation existed. So there was a tension there between 
these two groups, okay? And Paul doesn't want tension in the church. He doesn't want that pressure in the church, okay? He doesn't want, he doesn't want, he wants people to hang out together, okay? And you remember in the council in Acts 15, okay? There was, there was some in that council who wanted to make sure that people held on to Judaism. Do you remember that? They wanted Christians. The Judaizer says, you can't be a Christian unless you still keep the Mosaic law. You can't be a Christian uh, Gentile unless you get circumcised. You know, Josephus, Josephus is a, a fascinating read if you want to read the history at this time of the world. Josephus wrote uh, that the, there were Jews living in Rome at this time when the book of Romans was, was written, there were Jews living in Rome who, who lived on fruit all the time because they were afraid of eating something that was unclean. Now, this can happen even among believers in Rome because there's, there's some believers that are still stuck on laws that long ago have been abrogated. Jesus, what did Jesus say in Mark 7? Jesus said in Mark 7, listen to me, folks. Jesus said in Mark 7, it is no longer that which goes in the man that, defi that defiles him. It's no longer that which goes into the man that now defiles him, okay? It is that which comes out of the man that defiles him, okay? It's that which comes out of him. Garbage in, garbage out, maybe. But uh, in Mark, uh, Mark 7, 15 through 19 is that discourse. And, and, and we can see then that the pressure was on the Jews to maintain their her heritage and they wanted to cling on to it. And that's understandable, isn't it? Isn't that understandable? So it's understandable. Listen, it's understandable. You know how you get to understand somebody? You talk to them. And you know how you talk to them? With kind words. And you know what your kind words do? They break down barriers. And when barriers are broken down, people grow in understanding. And you'll be surprised what, what, what you might learn about your brothers and sisters in the Lord when you let those barriers get broken down. Okay? When you take the time, when you put forth the effort to understand, well, why is it that so-and-so is like that? Talk to so-and-so and figure it out. Don't condemn them. Don't look down on them. Pick them up. Help them to understand the freedom they have in the Lord. But God forbid that you would condemn them. My Lord. My Lord. Stand with me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the the opportunity, I believe, Lord, to, to better understand ourselves. I think your word uh, speaks to us about who we are. Uh, I know over the, over the years, Lord, you've, you've changed me. I feel uh, when I was saved many years ago, Lord, I, I feel I was much more bound than I am bound today. And yet, Lord, I still feel holier today than I did then. I believe you've worked in my life. Uh, to draw me closer to you. So, Lord, Lord I, just, I just want to entreat uh, the body today, Lord, to try to understand each other. And, Lord, uh, let not uh, uh, negative words come out of our mouth, but let positive words come out of our mouth. And, Father, when we fail you, just help us to confess, repent, pick ourselves up, and get on with the business at hand, which is the business of worshiping and glorifying you. And Lord, as we, as we speak today, we speak, we speak out of knowledge of you, Father. But Lord, in a, in a gathering of this size with this many people, Lord, we, we understand that there's some here who don't know you, Lord. There's some here that have, may have come to church for years upon years and still don't know, still don't have the personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So Lord, first and foremost, foremost we lift up this time to anyone who might come to saving knowledge of you, to anyone who might desire, Lord, to become a follower of Jesus Christ, to take up their cross and to follow you, to walk down the pathway, which is a pathway of righteousness, which is a pathway of knowledge, 
which is a pathway of peace, comfort, mercy, and most especially, Lord, grace. So, Lord, as your spirit moves amongst us today, we, we give that to we pray that that might be true in someone's life today. And Lord, if they're there, those here today, Lord, that need to uh, be drawn back to you. Maybe they've, maybe they've slid away. Maybe they've allowed life's circumstances to step in the way of their faith. Maybe they've allowed certain people and certain things to come between you and them. Maybe, Father, they've, 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 they've fallen prey to meism, selfishness. Lord, if, if there's that need, Lord, the altar is open, Lord. We, we, we have an altar here so that we can kneel before you, so we can become prostrate before you and, 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 and lift up the name of God. Lord, whatever the need might be today, maybe someone has a praise to share with the body. Maybe someone, Lord, just needs prayer, a time with you alone. And maybe someone needs to speak to me, Lord. Maybe they... There's a need for counsel. Whatever the need, Lord, is, we desire today to give you this time, not our time. We understand, Lord, that uh, we are just your mouthpiece, that you are, you are Lord, Savior, Creator, that you stand over everything and you look down upon us, Lord, even as uh, minuscule as we might be, and you still love us. And you have great things for us, Lord. You have victory for us. So, Father, help us to exercise that victory. And, Lord, when we understand, when we, when every time we make a, a, a step in our, in our growth, every time we're drawn closer to you, Lord, help us to proclaim that it is not by us, but it is by you. And, Father, we give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray.